Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to TRD Talks Live. TRD Talks Live is a new product that uh, Real Deal created uh, to better inform the market and the industry on all the changes that are taking place today. And we're talking to uh, market leaders and market experts on uh, how they're coping and how they are dealing with everything that's uh, going on. Um, if you're not a subscriber to The Real Deal, you're watching this for free, and please, after the program, go and subscribe to The Real Deal. If you believe in the value that we bring to your inbox, to your website, to your desktop, go after the program and subscribe to The Real Deal. We appreciate it. You're uh, supporting independent journalism, and that's key. So please do that after this. It literally adds up to 40 cents a day. So I want to jump right into it. I already had a chance to talk to the, the panelists beforehand. I know they're all doing well, so I'm not going to ask them how well they're doing. We have Shahab Carmeli from Car Properties. We have uh, JP Perez from Related, the heir to the throne. And uh, we have Eduardo Fortuna, who is a developer and also has the luxury of being owning one of the largest uh, brokerages in South Florida in Fortune Realty. JP, I want to start off with you and ask you, what is the thing that's worrying you the most right now? If things were to, just, if things were to fall in place in a wrong way, what are the things that, that's keeping you up at night? Uh, I think the thing that worries me the most, um, if this, this you know, pandemic continues to last for, for a while, is the amount of jobs that have been lost, right? Unemployment going through the roof, um, which then will, will affect um, the renters, which then flows down to the landlords. Um, you know, we were pleasantly surprised um, with our collections um, in the month of April from the renters. You know, we averaged about 90% collections. Um, we were prefer preparing for the worst. You know, we did analysis assuming 50% didn't pay. Um, so we were, we were very happy with collections. So, you know, I, I think if, if, if this continues for um, three, four, five, six months, um, you know, the, the unemployment is going to continue to grow, which will then uh, really impact um, people that will, they will not be able to pay rent. Um, so and, your biggest concern going to sleep at night is that uh, people won't be able to play, uh, pay, pay rent and that will trickle down to your business, obviously, in a, in a major way. And that's people losing jobs and people not being able to pay rent and the domino effect. And, and Correct, that. yeah. Because you know the the longer the economy shut down, um, there's there's just no there's no commerce, right? There's no business being being done, especially in the the retail, the service, hospitality. Um, South Florida is very dependent on uh, the service and, and tourism industry, um, so that affects a lot of jobs. Right. Well, the job market is already looking pretty, you know. Uh, Horrible, and it's, it looks like it's going to continue to go in that direction. Do you feel like what you're worried the most about is going to come to realization? No, I think the government's doing a very good job with uh, with releasing the stimulus packages. You know, small business loans, additional unemployment, um, backstopping the lenders. So I think you know everybody's in this together. Um, so. So even the, 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 the ones who are affected with losing their jobs, they are still getting stimulus, right? They're getting direct deposits of $1,200 uh, to their bank account, and then they get an additional $600 a week. So, so they're, even with the loss of the, the jobs, they are still getting funds to sustain uh, their lives during this unfortunate time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's obviously not a long-term solution. And pretty much every company that I talk to and every uh, you know, CEO that I've talked to in the last month, month and a half, everybody's talking about restructuring and regrouping and laying off people. Are you guys, Shahab, Eduardo, are you guys uh, looking to restructure and regroup and uh, lay off people? Um, in our case, we made the decision to keep the team intact, um, uh, at least for the time being, for the, uh, I, as, uh, I echo what JP said about the programs that the government instituted. So uh, we're trying to work through those programs and, and figure out how we can keep uh, the team intact because it took us a long time to build it up and we have people, most of our employees are 10 years and older. So, so, you, so, so if Fortune is not laying off anybody, you're gonna get the PPP uh, uh, support that the government is offering and you're gonna use that to keep everybody in there. Mm -hmm. Right, right. What concerns me is my agents. I mean, a lot of the 
of the real estate agents that are obviously are in only commission based and and a, if this lasts for a very long period of time um, the, the worries me the most is how those agents are going to to continue to survive even though there is some uh, a number of transactions still happen at the moment it obviously significantly less than than in a, in a regular do you foresee that in a few months when we come out of this and uh, like the dust has settled, do you, do you foresee that there's going to be a lot less agents in the business? Because I feel like, uh, you know, you have, to, you know, after uh, like in the early 2000s, you had a big boom in the number of eight, number of people who wanted to become agents, right? And then that sort of died down. And then after the Great Recession, when there was very little jobs, a lot of people became agents again. And now you're going to have this big unemployment, uh, you know, uh, happening. And... At the same time, you have agents not being able to sell, but at the same time, you have a lot of people who are unemployed who want to go and do something. What do you think is going to happen to the brokerage business? I think that it could be positive for the brokerage business in the long run. They, real estate is going to continue to be a great asset and, and people are going to, uh, to continue to invest in it. The, um, the biggest question is the timing on when this is going to happen, but um, the people that are having regular jobs suddenly could be good at, at selling real estate. Or um, a lot of people are are reinventing themselves in the in the virtual arena. So I, I think that it could go either way. It, um, the the key component is the length of time. Mm -hmm. Shahab, you're an active developer. You have a, a site in Hollandale that you're about to top off on. And you have uh, two sites, I think, in Miami River that you haven't started building on. What, where is the, all of this put you in? I mean, are you going to be able to keep uh, your investors, uh, you know, content with the situation right now? Are they threatening to pull out? What, what, what's uh, what's the situation for developers? Well, uh, I don't have investors. I have one partner uh, who is very much aligned with me, and and uh, I have a lot of my own money in my own projects. So uh, there's no premature pullout here. Uh, I will tell you that on a macro level, uh, the length of time that this takes, the longer it takes, the more of a contagion for the economy is going to be. And fortunately, there was an interesting leader in The Economist, in the economist last week. Fortunately, there are now voices coming to fore for questioning the degree of the shutdown, the length of the shutdown, and the fact that the economic price that we will pay if this goes on for a period of four, five, six months, if the only factor taken into consideration is an epidemiologist who takes the best case scenario of suppressing the growth of this, we're never going to wipe this out. It's either a vaccine or a cure. No amount of shutdown is going to wipe this out. Unfortunately, there's, there are voices now on the rationale of how about an opening up and how about uh, putting resources towards protecting really the most vulnerable in its midst, which we have an obligation to do, and supporting them or protecting them, but letting the economy function. Because if you allow a return to business, if you allow a return to prosperity, we will have the wealth and the resources and the ingenuity that is unique to this country to fight this or any other future pandemic that may come our way. So this, this prolonged shutdown is, is a mistake. And I think more people are waking up to this. I'm more optimistic that despite some of the recommendations from the medical sector, there is going to be a decision based on other factors, not only the initial panic reaction that we're witnessing. Mm -hmm. This, in a way, Amir, in a way, this is our Marshall Plan moment. You know, uh, I, I would argue that if you were standing in Europe in 1945, 1946, and, and looking forward, you would think there's no coming back from that. And, mm -hmm. and this compares in no way, shape, or form in any way to the calamity the human tragedy that, that the World War II was. In some ways, it's worse in that the whole world has shut down. It's not, it's, not, it's not worse. This is a collective slowing down, which is going to spring back. One of the interesting factors is that when the global financial crisis happened, it was a crisis of confidence in the business of business. It was a crisis of confidence in the fundamentals of capitalism. Here we are, a car that was going down the highway, perfectly tuned, perfectly pitched, a lot having to do with our president's policies and other factors, and all of a sudden there was a collective stop. And now there's going to be a restart. And yes, there, there are going to be factors, there are going to be sectors such as uh, hospitality, which will have a more difficult time coming back. Cruises will probably struggle, cruise ship business will struggle, but there are other factors, tech, real estate, uh, healthcare, 
these are these are sectors that are going to come roaring back. And we hope so. We hope so. But let me ask I would, you. I would, I, would, I would think that would be the case. Do you feel that the government is so desperate to get the economy going? And they're putting this, uh, rapidly throwing this $2 trillion together and they're issuing it out. You guys have gone for financing before. You know how much paperwork it takes to just get a simple mortgage for just one of your one bedroom stu- condos or you know studios. So right now they're throwing $2 trillion at this and they're issuing it at a rapid pace. Even the government is so desperate to get things going again that they're gonna lower standards for mortgages again so that you, you know, where we're gonna be back in uh, the stages where we're in 2007, 2008 because Look, people are just so desperate to get things going. I wouldn't, use, I wouldn't use desperate. I think the semantics is not desperation, it's being efficient, it's having learned the lessons of the previous rescue package. The last time, with a crisis that was purely financial in nature, the response was slow and trickle. Mm -hmm. This time around, there were lessons learned, and I think they're doing an excellent job, and it's not desperation, It's, it's, it's being realistic, realizing that this is a big problem, which requires a big solution. And to your point of real estate, so let's take this down three, six, 12 months down the road, and we're very real estate specific, so I would like to address that. No matter what, when you inflate the M2 supply at the rate that you're alluding to, which is unprecedented uh, uh, since the previous World War, to so stimulate the economy to that level, you will have quality asset inflation, right? Uh, people will be out there investing. People will be out there comparing different investment pools. And as far as real estate goes, it has always proven to be an excellent hedge against inflation and a great storehouse of value. So I would argue that in the midst of all this, uh, people should be looking at the future investment moves. And yes, granted, those are those who don't have money to invest, but the relief program from the government is effective, it's large, and will provide in time a great deal of relief. Let me paint a picture for all three of you guys right now, because I, I believe that just the way September 11 changed the way we traveled, just the way uh, you know the Great Recession changed the way we invested and how banks work, uh, I feel like this is going to completely change real estate, right? So I'm going to paint a picture for you guys. We have a company with 10,000 square feet, right? 10,000 square feet. And all of a sudden I'm realizing, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking just an example. Uh, you have 10,000 square feet, and all of a sudden for the last month, you are uh, using Zoom and teleconferencing to uh, connect with people, with your clients, uh, with, your, you know, with, uh, you know, with your employees and everybody else. And all of a sudden you realize in the 1990s, I outsourced my call services to India and other places because all of a sudden I realized I don't need to have an extra floor in my commercial space to uh, house those uh, call centers. They can be anywhere in the world. Now I'm realizing, hold on, maybe I don't need a lot of those middle management and some of those analysts here. I don't have to pay for their overhead. They could be in the, uh, you know, uh, Ashland, North Carolina. And instead of them being in Miami where I would have to pay them more, I have them in Ashland, North Carolina where they're, uh, you know, I have to pay them less and they're happier because they get to send their kids to good schools and they're near their family and they could be anywhere they want. All of a sudden you have people that don't have to be in the city, in the gateway cities. Okay? I'm talking about New York, Miami, and these places. And then what effect will that have? What, how will that trickle down? Because you guys are relying on some of those jobs coming to uh, Miami so that people can buy the condos that you guys uh, develop. Do you believe there's going to be some sort of a shift where people just don't have to be physically in a space for them to work? I mean, for, our, for my business, for example, look, a lot of the work that we do is digital, right? So I don't need people physically there. I can see the work that they do digitally. It's, it shows very easily. They can be anywhere in the world and I can see their productivity. So do you feel that that's going to have some sort of an effect in terms of how fundamentally real estate is going to be used? I, I, I can tell you something, Amir. Uh, I fundamentally disagree with that. These are the same arguments we had with the paperless office, which now is a seven-fold use of paper because everything presses click and print. And Nesbitt and those guys, those famous futurologists at the end of the last century, uh, we're predicting, and Paul Krugman was predicting a completely nomadic uh, system of employment. The fact is nothing replaces human to human contact. The golden age of Greece was the development of a city state with the ascendancy of Athens. The Renaissance began with Florence and the move to the cities, right? So human, human ingenuity, uh, face-to-face contact, collaboration, 
from a, from a DNA point of view, from the way we've evolved, human beings do not function well in isolation. Well, I agree with that. But look, you could have said the same thing about the call centers, right? So you could have said, hey, those call centers need to be here. Well, I'm not saying that we're going to isolate ourselves in closets. I'm saying that you're going to have people who are going to be in offices, but you're, not, you're just not going to have as many. Very, very different, very, very, very different example. And I will tell you why the two do not compare. Call centers are providing a service which are remote in their nature. They are interacting with a client who by its very nature is calling it from a remote location. So whether B connects to A or B connects to B, the net result is the same. But the kind of collaboration, the kind of thinking, the kind of interaction that human beings thrive, and that's why the source of innovation has been cities, is not going to go away. And I think, yes, there's going to be, of course, there's going to be some fallout. There are going to be some people who are going to think I can do better in the country. But people are not cities to work in their offices. It's restaurants. It's, it's cultural diversity. It's ease of transport. It's hospital services, educational services. All the things that draw people to cities, all the things that make cities centers of innovation. And but now you get cities being in a dense place. Now it's become a dangerous thing, right? Like for, for a pandemic, like all of a sudden, do you really believe that when this is all said and done, that you're going to go to, uh, well, not that you would, but you go to like some of these big nightclubs in Miami where they get packed and people are on top of each other. And uh, do you believe that that's going to happen again? I mean, like, I'm willing to make a dollar bet right now, a signed dollar bet right now, assuming there is not a black swan event, which I don't think there will be, and assuming this virus does not mutate, which doesn't sound like it will be, but I'm not a scientist. It's from my reading, I don't think it will. This is not the first pandemic. It's not the last pandemic. If you, I, I would suggest everybody on this podcast, if they're interested, they should read on the so-called Spanish flu of 17, right, 18, right. 19, which had nothing to do with Spain, but it was started in Kansas. Everything came roaring back. I am willing to bet you a dollar now that unless there's a mutation of this virus and something happens based on the numbers and what's happening now, a year from now, you and I will be having a drink in a night closure. It's going to be just as packed as ever. So put this down and you and I have a dollar bet. You got it. It's on. Absolutely. It's on. And Gordon, you rely heavily on international buyers. Uh, JP, you guys rely heavily on international buyers. Obviously, you know, the borders were, some, uh, were the first things to get shut down with this. How do you think long term? and being worried about viruses, being worried about infectious diseases, how is that going to affect uh, international buyers and foreign buyers coming in? Oh, I, I'm going to tell you a story of, of a couple of calls that I got from international buyers, clients already of ours, that, are, that have the apartments uh, in the market to rent uh, and call us to not rent the apartments because they are thinking that they want to come back to Miami as soon as possible and as soon as they are allowed because they are concerned that um, the, the problem in their countries when, when here is going to be summer and there is going to be winter, it's going to get worse there. And they're so happy that they have a second home to come to and be able to. The, the, the value so you believe that international buyers, the foreign buyers, that number is going to remain high for Miami? You do believe uh, Absolutely. I mean, uh, they, they are thinking that. If, if after this happens, the U.S. is the first one to recover for sure, that, that Miami is primed to be there uh, to receive that recovery. And, and, and real estate is something that they really uh, um, embrace and, and it's an asset class that they really want to invest in. And, and the, the, the value of a home today, the, the place where you live and your lifestyle is, is become so much more important now than, than in the past. I mean, uh, we didn't realize where we lived on. I mean, we, uh, I was talking to my wife and we said, we spent two and a half hours designing and building this house. And, and many times we didn't even enjoy it the way we're enjoying it now because it really is a blessing to live in South Florida and to be able to, uh, to do what we do. And, and we, we hear from New Yorkers all the time. I mean, uh, that uh, having the, if before this pandemic, they were coming here for taxes and stuff. Now the lifestyle to be able to walk uh, out the boardwalk in Miami Beach or to uh, to be on and and like the JP and I we were talking before the the broadcast started about getting together on Sunday and boat to boat outside in the bay. I mean those things are are really not not comparable anywhere else. And and I think that we're positioned very very well. I hate to admit it. I hate to admit it, but most of the people I talk to here in the city, uh, they're saying, man. 
we should go down to Miami. <laughs> so a lot of people are telling me, hey, we should be down in Miami right now. You'll be hearing that more and more, Amir, we even should. when this all blows over. <laughs> I, I hate to Irreversible it. trend. Um, I'd like to ask you guys, you know, after the SARS um, epidemic, uh, the insurance companies lobbied to have infectious diseases removed from insurance policies. And now a lot of, of it for business policies and for uh, buildings. Is that something that should be included in insurance, especially for building insurance? Well, I know there's a big, you know, there's a lot of lobbying going on to include it. Right now it's excluded from the definition of force majeure. Um, you know, I, I think we all on this, on this, on this phone uh, interview believe that it should be included. Um, you know, if they do include it and the lobbying works, I think then you'll have the insurance company, company needing to be backstopped by the government. So there have to be more stimulus there because you'll have multiple, multiple claims uh, on those policies. Um, but I think it, it looks like they, they will probably change that definition to include it. You guys, all three of you guys have, uh, you know, multifamilies and, um, you know, rental units and office and commercial spaces. Are you guys offering any deferments uh, for uh, for your tenants right now? Is that even the? Are you guys even talking about that to them? Because I'm sure all, a lot of people that I'm talking to, they're saying they're withholding rents, right? I mean, related in New York said that only 26% of their uh, retail tenants paid rent in April. Only 26%, and 80% of their commercial tenants paid rent. And um, I, I mean, it's, I feel like a lot of people are pulling back. That's just a regular attitude. And they're just saying, like, let's see what the government comes up with before I write this checkout that I don't know if I'm ever going to see again. Yeah, I mean, you know, definitely in the commercials hit harder than, than the residential. Um, you know, the commercial collections are, if you get 20%, I think you're, you're, you're sort of happy and jumping up and down. Wow. Um, on the apartment side, like I said before, we're averaging almost 90% collections. Right. Um, re really, you know, our stance and our opinion is, you know, if you are, you know, a major company or you are a renter that has the wherewithal and can afford to pay your rent, you know, you have the obligation to pay your rent, right? Mm -hmm. So that helps the landlord deal with and, and help the others that are actually impacted by the virus and help them, you know, give them a payment plan or some delayed payments. But if all of a sudden, you know, you know, whoever it is without a, that has a job and that can actually pay rent decides, Hey, you know what, let me just not pay rent and let me see if I can get away with this and, and, and take advantage of this. Um, you know, the government not allowing evictions, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden as a landlord, you can't help the, the others that are actually really impacted from this virus. Um, so basically our stance is, you know, we sit with everybody that, that says, you know, you know, we, we either can't pay or we need to, to, to in a, institute a payment plan. And we sit there and we say, okay, well, what, what happened? How were you impacted? Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, it's, it's a personal one-on-one -on -one phone conversation with, the, with an apartment renter, with a commercial tenant. And we sit there and we try to, we try to work with them. I'm to, guessing uh, you're having these conversations all day long right now, then. It's all day long. I mean, it's, it's for, you know, April 1st was, uh, rent was due and, uh, we're still having those conversations now. Right. Um, and it's going to continue next month and probably the month after. And then you're saying that only 20% of your commercial tenants paid for April? We had about 20% pay, yeah. Wow, that's, that's, uh, well, you know, if you yeah, have a grocery, if, if you have a supermarket, they should pay. Right. right. If you have a CVS, they should right. pay. If you right. have uh, some sort of medical service, they should pay. Um, so there's some businesses that are that are you know essential and open and actually doing better now probably than than they were in the crisis. Um, so when they come to you and say, "Hey, we're just blanketly you know not paying," you you go to them and say that that's that no, you, your rent is due. Um, right. And then if you have if you have these like a state and federal policies in place where you can't evict people, that doesn't leave you with much leverage, you know, to sort of force their hand to pay, does it? No, it, it does not. Um, you know, I think there's a 90 day moratorium on evictions. Um, so and, and um, you know, you, you just you have no sort of leverage. But but I think when you actually get the one on one conversations and speak to, to uh, the, the individuals, they actually see that you're, you know, you have some empathy for them and, and you want to work with them, right? We're, 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 what I try to say is that everybody's in this together, right? There's nobody that's not affected by this, by this, uh, this crisis. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I, I do believe that a lot of the, the small businesses also we're working, I mean, we're waiting for the, the, the plan 
and the funding from the government to be instituted, and that's why they hold back rents. And they, some of that money that is coming from the government is going to allow not only to pay for, for salaries, but also to pay for rent. So we're, we're hearing from tenants saying, hey, let me uh, get the funding and see what I can pay. And of course, like JP said, you have to work with them because uh, it's better to have a great tenant that uh, always has been paying than having an empty space. So you, you will have to work with those tenants to figure out something, solution that is that's agreeable to everybody in order to, to maintain those small centers and, and those uh, tenants that are really not to their fault, their own fault are yeah. falling yeah. behind. I want to ask uh, if there is a lot of, obviously a lot of contracts out there and are people asking to back out of their contracts for the condo purchases? That, 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 that must yeah. That I, I just feel like that has to be the case in, in, in at least. But, but, but uh, and we're, in Miami, we're very, very unique in the sense that all the contracts, the pre-construction contracts, are very significant deposits being placed. So if with 50% deposits, no backing, nobody's backing out of contracts. We, uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, we, we got TCO on the Rich Carlton residences in March 10th or something like that. So we started closing right in the middle of this. And and we closed 80 units so far, most of them virtual, most of them with foreign buyers. And we had a $210 million construction loan and we're down to 50 mm -hmm. paying it off. So yeah. people are, are really executing. Of course, we're working with them. We're helping them uh, work through the appraisals and banks and and notarizations and all of that, but but that's a testament to, to, to people really loving what they bought and and really not having the choice of, of I, I just feel like a lot of people might think that hey, you know, the world is not the same place as it was when I put in my deposit. Maybe I can use some sort of uh, maybe I could back out of the deal now because obviously you, I think everybody here would have to agree that prices have to come down, right? Commercial prices, retail prices, condo prices, they have to come down. Does anybody disagree with me? And if you do, I'd like to hear why. I think it remains to be seen. I think the general consensus is that, but I, I you know, a lot of the same, you know, take it for granted pessimism, I'm kind of hearing from you, Amir. And I guess it's, it's, it's your job. Questions. I guess it's I'm your job. I guess it's your job as an independent <laughs> reporter to to be the devil's advocate. I don't I don't necessarily say the case here short term. You're right. There's going to be short term in and, and some sectors. Look to JP's point, there are sectors that occupy real estate that not only are not going to go down in value, they're going to go up in value. And I think you're going to have a flight to quality, the US is quality. I think you're going to have a flight to lifestyle, Miami's lifestyle. And, you know, if you're overly leveraged or you're squeezed and you have to move inventory quickly, that can happen in the best of times. People, I just want to I just want to the record and say that I think Miami is going to see a big boom from this whole thing. I think it's going to become a real haven for a lot of people across the country. But I do think that prices are generally going to be depressed. I mean, if I, I, like when you talk to these big asset managers and they're saying they're shorting the hell out of these REITs, you have to think there has to be a chain effect to that, right? So it's that, like that, that, commercial is going to affect residential, retail, you know, like down the line. Certain investment, it's, it's fragmented. I don't think you can take all of the entire real estate sector right. and make a general prediction, but there are sectors that are going to be affected more than other sectors. Eduardo, what do you think about specifically about condo pricing? Well, I mean, again, the, 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 most of the developers that we work with uh, are very well funded and, and very well pre-sold. So, they don't need to sell in, in a depressed market. I mean, they might take a, an offer or something today if they, uh, if they consider it reasonable, maybe yes, but um, there is not gonna be significant down uh, pressure on those, those units. The, the bigger question mark is the, the resale inventory, especially being, hauled, well, being held by, by foreigners. I mean, I don't know how they're gonna react to the need of cash or need to sell, and, and that might create uh, both opportunities and, and some downward pressure and, and some pricing. But, but in general terms, I don't see a, a major developers reducing in prices significantly. So you, you don't see a price drop at all then, Eduardo? Well, go ahead, JP. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with Eduardo and, and, and Jahab. I think, you know, um, if Latin Americans are, are, are they want um, 
capital. They, they want to preserve their cash. They want to. They want to know when they put their cash uh, in the states, they, it, it's safe, right? I think they're going to feel. I want to feel that. I, I feel that they're going to feel even more safe, taking more money out of their countries, coming into uh, South Florida to invest in 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 condos, and and I think you ha- you're going to have a pent up demand from the northeastern that are that are in apartments right now saying wow you know the quality of life really is you know you can't even you can't compare it to to, to new york you know living in south florida so i think you're going to have demand not only from the north but also from more from latin america and like edgardo said you know none of none of the developers this time around have have uh, leverage where where they have to make you know rash decisions and, and uh fire sale so i i don't see there being a big um, reduction in prices, uh, if if at all. Mm-hmm. That's that's interesting. I, Amir, in, I, ask, great recession, I, ask, I ask you a question, Amir. So, yeah. would you within within your outlook that there has to be a reduction? And you know, by has to, I assume you're not talking about thirty, sixty, ninety days. You're talking about the longer term. You know, reverse boomerang effect, right? The reverse link. I'm saying, like, we're going to come back to a market. Yeah. People are going to start showing your apartments you're not going to see the same prices when you go to see those same apartments. I feel like I think you'll see a patchwork, but mm-hmm. over the longer term, back to my point of the fact that when you increase your money supply, the way the government is doing right now, mm-hmm. it's basic fundamental economics that you will see a relative. It's not, it's, it's not market scarcity and it's not market driven. It's just a function of how much quality real estate there is in exchange for how much paper money there is. And I don't think you can argue with the fact that we're going to come out of this with a lot more of those paper things floating around that we call dollars in this economy. The, the inventory of the condominiums is going to be the same. The quality assets are going to be the same. And as always, you will have a flight to quality and condos of the type that, you know, uh, relate to develops and, and, and uh, Agarda develops and we hopefully are developing uh, are, are storehouses of value and they're storehouses of value where you get practical use out of them. You get to live in them in, these, in, in one of the world's great, most beautiful cities. And would, they will hold their relative value compared to the inflation that's going to be created as a result of the stimulus. So I think that should be taken. I mean, there's never one single factor, right? So this is, these are complicated economies, a, a variety of factors that go into what happens. And the point I'm trying to make is that the same way we should consider our actions going forward and when we open up the economy again and not just only base it on the, on the epidemiological considerations, but other considerations as well. This general attitude that there's got to, have, there's got to be a, a price reduction. There's got to be blood in the streets. Yes. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think they're well, right. I hope, I hope you're right. You know, and I, the same way that this came out of left field and surprised us all in a negative way, I really do believe that other things could come and surprise us in a really positive way too. And, you know, I think it's sort of the cycle and that's how the world works. And uh, JP, during the last uh, downturn, during the great recession, you guys put together a billion and a half dollars and that was, uh, and you guys came out, you, you made some really good deals and you, you know, you benefited uh, sort of from that, which was very smart. Are, what steps are you guys taking now to sort of uh, take advantage of where the market's going to be three months, six months from now? No, no. We, so we always have our eyes open for opportunities. Um, we have not seen many as of yet. I think it's too early. I think you're going to see uh, the opportunities come out, you know, July, August, and summer. Um, obviously, hospitality, there's going to be lots of opportunities with hotels just being shut down from, uh, from one day to the next. You're interested. Um, you guys are interested in that. You know, we look at all asset classes, um, so we wouldn't rule out hotels. We most likely would partner with an operator if we were going to buy a hotel. Um, so far, what we've seen is there, there's been a couple of note sales, uh, mortgages that that uh, that lenders and, and banks are trying to, to to get off their books. Right. Um, it just hasn't been priced right for 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 our interest yet. Um, but I think you're going to see more and more of that. You know, two weeks ago, a lot of the the mortgage REITs were having margin calls, and th- there was some trading going on. Um, but I think now that's normalized. Um, but I think you'll see there should be some land deals if, you know, there was a you know, developer bought a piece of land with, you know, a lot of leverage, high interest rate, thought he was going to start in a certain amount of time, 
Uh, now, obviously, financing is harder to come by, and maybe it's you know it's pushed out months. So there may be an opportunity. Credit is going to be dry, right? So credit is definitely going to be dry, which I think it's great for the buildings and for the inventory that is available right now. But you, does everybody agree that you're going to have dried up credit, uh, you know, when we come out of this? I mean, do you think banks are going to be lending for construction and uh, you know new projects? I think credit is going to be harder to come by and the banks will look harder at the deals and the sponsorship. So someone like Edgardo, someone like uh, Related, uh, JP and his father, they're going to be out there. In some ways, the banks are going to want to work with them even harder because the pool of people who would be their borrowers is going to be diminished. So the same way uh, buyers are going to have a, a flight towards quality, lenders who at the end of the day, I mean, if they don't lend, they're not making money and they're not affording those lifestyles and those homes in the Hamptons. They also have to lend, right? And, and I think they're going to be more careful about who they're working with, but there will be lending and, and there will be projects to, going forward. And to JP's point in the midst of this, there will be some opportunities. There'll be some winners and some losers, but that's capitalism. Right. Uh, JP, you guys, uh, the last project I think you guys did was three years ago. And uh, this is, and you, you guys started doing more multifamilies. Am I mistaken about that? Or the last project we did was three the, years ago. I don't last, understand. That. The last condo project that you guys did in Miami was three years ago. Is that correct? The last London? The, la the last start? Yeah. No, the last start was Pompano, uh, Pompano maybe a month right. ago. But you guys are doing a lot more multifamilies now, and are you going to continue, uh, you know, doing more of those instead of condos? You know, the, the condo market's very, you know, it's up and down, right? It's, uh, it's, um, it's very market driven. You know, you, we've been on a good ten year run with the condos. Uh, it's, it's sort of slowed down. It's not as, uh, you know, you're not selling nowhere, anywhere near as much as we were, you know, three, four, five years ago. Um, but what we did after the recession is we said, hey, we don't want to have all of our eggs in one basket. We want to be diversified. Um, so when there isn't a condo market, we still have different divisions that are, that are, that are profitable. And, um, you know, I think we, we started 3,000 units last year on the multifamily side and another 4,000 affordable. Wow. So I think we have pretty much the same pipeline scheduled for this year. Um, so, so the condo really just comes in and out when the timing's right in the market. Um, but those other divisions are still um, very strong. Eduardo, uh, you guys uh, obviously are uh, big marketers. How are you suggesting to your people to market now? Is this, a, is this an insensitive time to market or are you suggesting for your guys to be in touch with their clients and still continue marketing? And how are you doing marketing right now? Well, um, the reality is that we many uh, of our the tools that we were using to market uh, to foreign buyers and, and to sell the dream before the building was built are still very valid today. I and mean, we had all the renderings and all the videos and all the drawings that we had when we um, launched a project that you had to sell the dream and have the buyer visualize uh, what they're buying. So we're utilizing those tools in a very sensitive way. I mean, you can't be too aggressive today, both neither with brokers nor, nor with buyers into trying to, to sell them something. We're trying to keep them informed. It's similar to what you're doing uh, with this live talks. Uh, it's, it's really getting the people uh, and creating more knowledge. People that have more time to be in front of, of the computer and receiving the information, and hopefully building up a, a, a list of potential um, customers that are going to come uh, back when this um, all crisis passes. So um, we're generating leads, trying to figure out what their appetite is and what type of product they need, and hopefully adjusting that as soon as um, things go back to normal so they can pull the trigger and purchase what they like. Uh just, uh, I had a question from a uh, gentleman here. He wants to know if you believe because there's going to be uh, the globalized world is going to not be as globalized as before. Do you guys believe that manufacturing will come back to the U.S. more as a result of this? It certainly 100% will. Manufacturing will come back. Certain types of manufacturing. I think uh, I was not aware. Uh, beforehand that 85% of the antibiotic supply of the world comes from China. There's, there's certain types of strategic manufacturing that is going to come from China back to the U.S. And then I think there's going to be a China uh, phobic, somewhat of a China phobic or somewhat China 
distaste, lingering aftertaste. Uh, you know, we're already talking about massive losses against China, and one of those is going to be launched somewhere. So I think uh, some of what we can manufacture effectively here will come back, and I and I think whether. Uh, you have a Republican uh, in the White House in the next election or a Democrat. Both parties are going to work towards an America, so-called America first mm-hmm. policy in terms of having jobs here and a return of manufacturing here. And I think on the long term, not, not to sound um, unsensitive and sensitive, but, but in the long term, as a result of this um, and the recovery that inevitably will follow and some of the negative and positive fallouts will inevitably come and the loss of that even a single person is a tragedy. Mm-hmm. But taking a step back, we will come out of this, relatively speaking to the rest of the world, stronger and, and, and more secure and, and have our manufacturing base benefit from this as opposed to the massive export of jobs that we've had to China over the past decade and a half. And JP, you guys do all sorts of different assets. I'm just curious, going forward, has, is, will this cause you guys to change anything that you do in terms of your developments? Will the way that you design, uh, you know, build or design buildings, is that going to change? The way that you build and design commercial space, is that going to change? Will this change any part of that? Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think we're 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 looking at those things now, right? I mean, I think uh, what are some examples? A, a simple example, right? You know, social distancing. Everybody's having to wear masks and gloves, right? So now, should we think about putting devices in in our residential buildings where no one really has to ever touch a button, yeah, or push open a door, right? So everything will be automated through your phone. So then you could, you know. You never have to, it, everybody should be focused on germs, right? Germophobia is going to be right. a huge thing that's talked about. Well, so. well, germophobes, we're onto something. <laughs> but now, we're all, now we're all germophobes right now. Um, but, but um, you know, I think the, the thinking is now, how do we implement that into office and even into uh, apartments that, that, you know, if this is going to be the sort of the new norm for at least the, the foreseeable future, we need to start thinking about those, those types of... Uh, what are the things you can do retroactively on existing projects? Well, retroactively, you can go back into buildings and, and rewire everything. Okay. Um, you know, that's a cost and we just have to analyze it. Um, but it might be, it might be worth it. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, no, I mean, Amir, Amir, one of the things that it's going to become more and more interesting is that we would all like to engage and, you know, I'm very security and tech oriented and uh, like one of the simple things you can do just to not to sound too sci-fi, but the kind of facial recognition and cameras we have, we can do, we can very easily retroactively or going forward fit these cameras as monitoring devices. Like when you're in China and have the SARS, you know, step into the score to see if your temperature is up or not. That can all exist. But at some point, there's going to be a clash between tracking safety, security, and personal freedoms. And one of the wonderful things that we have in the U.S. is this constitution that gives us all this bubble of privacy that we walk around. And more and more, there are going to be discussions about at what point are personal liberties given up, privacy concerns given up in order to combat the virus. We saw like after September 11th, all of a sudden we were comfortable with taking off our clothes to get to a plane, right? Yeah, and nobody questioned it. And I feel like you're going to have to sacrifice and compromise some of those things. I think it's going to be an interesting discussion. It's, yeah, just, it's, sure. it's, going, to be, it's going to be food for thought. But uh, yeah, the technology is there. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank our uh, speakers today. Thank you guys for taking the time and uh, being a part of this. I want to remind our uh, viewers that if you're not a subscriber, please go to therealdeal.com and subscribe and support independent journalism. If you find value in what we're doing here, please uh, do that and we appreciate it. And for all the people who did subscribe in the last couple of months, we noticed you, we acknowledge you, and we love you for it and thank you. And with that said, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amir. For hosting. Thank you, Amir. Absolutely, you? guys. Good to- Be good. Enjoy good Miami. I'm jealous. Keep doing this and Thank come God. visit us. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank All you. Right. Bye, Thank guys. you, guys. Thanks. Hey, guys. Take care.